thing, because I, I believe this is an important message, and it seems like one, God, that we could say, oh, we've said it so many times, but it's important, God. And I, I just pray that you'd open up our hearts. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. 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 Thanks, worship team. You guys are incredible. Oh. Yeah, so we, we connect with, just real quick, we connect with Paul and Ashley Perry in Brazil. I've had the privilege of going there twice and going into the Amazon and seeing what's there. So I've actually been to the church. What they're doing is they're, they're growing and they're reaching out. They, they reach out. It's only a church of like our size, like, like 75 people. And they're reaching out to 125 kids in the area, though. And I, and I love what they're doing, but they actually are getting ready to build a new facility. And, it, and it's really exciting because their, their old one is like, I think the whole place is like as big as our sanctuary. So it's really, really small there. And I'm excited that they're, that they're moving forward there. The pastor, his name is Marcos, and um, he's fantastic. So, I mean, I mean when, when we invest $1,000, I'm just telling you, it's going into a really good, solid, uh, spirit-filled church. Awesome church. Them and their team, they, they take a five-hour boat trip down into the Amazon and go out to the indigenous people. And, and they're, building, um, they're building a church out there as well. They dig wells. They do all kinds of things. It's such an incredible, incredible ministry that's going on there. And Paul and Ashley Perry, the missionaries that we um, are connected with, uh, are funding through us and through other people so much that goes on there. It's, it's incredible. So it's just a great thing that's happening there in Brazil. I'm so glad that we're continuing to be a part of that. And so exciting things. So if you were here over the last couple of weeks, you know that we've been talking on a series that, that had been called, well, it still is, it's called the, the uh, Holy Spirit. And so we talked about things like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We even talked about last week about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we started to, what I was about to do was I was about to teach, you need to come back next week unless God changes something, but you need to come back next week because I was about ready to get involved and begin to teach on tongues and the interpretation of tongues. So we want to take some of the gifts and kind of unpack them a little bit and say, what are these things? What, what is this stuff? He, he talks about these and I, I hear people even doing it maybe, but I don't, I don't understand what it is. And so we want to help you to understand what some of these gifts are and help you to find your gift as well, because it's really not as hard as a lot of people make it out to, but that's going to be an exciting time. But this Wednesday at Seek Night, which is seven o'clock on Wednesdays all the time, um, we came here, and you know, I, I was in a place of just of just hunger, and and which is where we really always should be. And I'm here, and I just I just really felt God say. I mean, I was already working on my message, and I just felt Him say, "That's we're changing it. That's not where we're going." We, we want, we, here's, here's what he said to me. I need you just for a moment. I think he's going to do this more often than we realize, just so everybody knows. I felt like he had told me, he said, I need you to get off the highway for just a moment. I need you to pull over and I need you to check your GPS. I need you to put some gas in the car. And what he was saying is spiritually, we need to stop just have, heading out on this track. There's nothing wrong with where, we're, where we were headed. We're going to get back to that. But there's going to be moments in your life all the time there should be, and even in our church as a body where God just says, hang on, I'm coming in. I want to say something. I want to, I want to do something a little bit different today. I, would, I got a special moment here for this hour. And so what I was sensing Wednesday night was this hunger that I had for God and how desperate I want to get back to that with, with our church. And I know that we've gone through We've gone through a lot of seasons of that because we've talked on being hungry for God and the presence of God so much. But I think there's a reality of that that we have not really experienced yet. And I think God is kind of, he'll, he'll bring us down a road as we move on and he'll, he'll show us some things. And then he'll want us to step back and say, hey, wait, 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 you've got to stay hungry. So you've got to stay in this place. This is going to be super important for these end days. For these last hours that we're in, if you're not hungry, if you're not paying attention to me, you're going to get run over by a train. You're going to get run over by the media. You're going to get run over by the government. You're going to get run over by this and by Facebook and by Instagram and all these things that go on in our lives. You're going to get run over by your own family. If you're not filled and strong in me, if you've got to be in the word. And so he was saying these things to me and I'm thinking, man, this is, this is incredible. But here's something else that I really heard him say. He said, I'm hungry for you. 
I'm hungry for you. And I thought, man, I, I gotta, I gotta talk about this somehow. And I don't know, um, I, I don't know if you guys may have a little problem following me today back there. I'm not sure because I'm not sure. I know what God wants to do. I've got a message, but I just know that in my heart, this is something that that it's God's heart, and it, it's really strong in my heart too. This, I mean, we've been talking about it forever, and um, to be hungry. And so, I, I just don't know exactly where it's going to go. But I titled this message "God's Hunger," God's Hunger. Because we always talk about our hunger, but there is a hunger from God that he has for his people. And it's very, very real. And I think that it's hard to sometimes hunger for him if we don't realize how much he hungers for us. And, and that's what I'm saying. I think he's taken us to a, okay, you've learned this part about hunger. Now let me, let me show you something else about hunger. And so he's kind of unfolding some different things. So you guys know we've talked about 2 Chronicles 7.14 so much it'd probably make everybody's ears bleed. But we're gonna, I'm going to mention it again today. Because like I said, there's a, there's a step back where we don't want to move from this. I actually look at this scripture, 2 Chronicles 7.14, which says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen. It's a powerful, powerful scripture. And here's how I see this right now today. I see this as the GPS for this hour, for this season that we're in. So many people, so many churches have, have kind of gotten off track and they've forgotten to stop at the gas station and they've forgotten to fuel up and they've forgotten that the presence of God is so important. And then they, they, we move on with our lives and we forget, wait a minute, this, this sin that's been creeping in is now like part of my life and it's, it's not okay. It's not okay that we as Christians live our lives that way. It's not okay that we as God's people don't pray to him except when we come to church. And that's when somebody else is praying. There's a, there's a relationship that you and I have got to have that has to become more real than ever before. I don't know about you, and I can't say this as some kind of fact. I would never put a date on when Christ is going to come back. But I know this, that this morning, he's closer to coming back than he was yesterday morning. <laughs> and so we're getting closer all the time. But it just seems, it seems that we're in the last days of the last days of the last days. That's what it seems like to me. Maybe, it, maybe it's, you know, I do think it'll, it'll get worse, but I'm, I'm just telling you that we're in those days and he expects his bride to be ready. The bride is you and I as Christians, born again Christians. He expects us to be ready. He expects us not to be lazy Christians. It's like, it's like, it's like, Brides, on your wedding day, the, your, your groom is here at the altar and you're still in the back trying to put on makeup. And now you realize it's time right now. And so you're rushing and you're trying to get everything done. And you come out and you kind of look like shambles, you know, because you, you weren't ready. You weren't ready. The Bible gives several different illustrations about that. But I'm seeing that one right now. And that we're kind of like that bride that's like, oh my gosh, you mean it's like today? As if you didn't even realize that your groom was coming, that this is the hour. And he says that we'll know the season. And I'm just telling you, it's not just me. There are people um, all over that are sensing that the season is now. The season is close. Is he going to come in my lifetime? I don't know, but it's going to be soon. It's getting closer all the time. And, and this is part of, I guess, what I'm feeling. I'm feeling this. There's a little bit of urgency to this message. There's there's hunger that's, that's in my heart. And when I, when I start to step away from that hunger. I mean, right now, like I, I begin to realize it and, and I don't like it. And it's a little bit hard to get back, but it's a discipline to get back. But man, when I come back, I'm just like, yes, this is where I need to be. This is, this is, this is what I long for. This is what I live for. And it's kind of interesting, but if you don't try to hunger, if you don't try to, to sense his presence, to get closer to him, you don't understand, I, I, and I mean that rightly. You literally don't understand what I'm talking about, to hunger after God. The Bible says that we are to hunger and thirst after God, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we've got to have this stirring on the inside of us. 
There is um, safety and strength and courage. Peace. Uh, peace. This world needs peace so bad. There's a peace when I'm right with God, so to speak. It's, and you don't get it anywhere else. His peace goes beyond any type of peace that this world can give us. And so I've got a question for everybody today. What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? What is distracting you from God more than anything else? Like, is there something in your life that you want? And I'm not even necessarily talking about sin. Is there something in your life that you want more than you want God? It could be money. It could be that I have a house. It could be that I, I, need, I need food. I've got to have food in my life. And that has to be more important than God because I've got to have food. But actually, no, it's not. He actually says that he's more, the hunger for him is more important than hungering for food. Because when we hunger for him, you know what? He actually says he'll, he'll take care of everything else. There's a, there's a place that we move into that we trust him, that we believe and that we, we can step into. And there's just that peace and there's that knowing that he's going to take care of me. But my hunger and thirst has to be for him above everything else. Above everything else. I read a quote on the internet just yesterday, actually. And it says, if you're not hungry for God, you're probably full of yourself. <laughs> you really think about that. That's not, that's, I know, drop the mic. <laughs> That's not as much of a slam as you might think. I think there's a lot of truth to that. We get so full of ourselves that we think that we don't need God. We get so full of, and it doesn't even have to be pride. We just get so full of this world. We get so full of what we want. Understand that what you want, that's selfishness. You want it. I got to have it. If I'm going to be happy, I need this. I need that. If I'm going to survive, I need this, I need that, if I, all these things. But, but he says that if he takes care of the birds and he takes care of the flowers, surely he's going to take care of his own kids. And so we can just relax in that and just say, God, I just, I just worship you. It doesn't mean that we don't go to our job and that we don't work hard and, and plan for the future and all those things. Of course it means that. But I don't desire those things. I don't desire even money more than the presence of God. You are not taking any money with you when this life is over. Nothing. Nothing. That's a, that's a weird thought. And as, as I get older, I'm not that old, but as I get older, that's a real sobering thought. None of this is going. Why don't you just start living for eternity now is what he wants us to do. Live for those things that are eternal, not for the things that are just going to fade away, that are just going to burn up in the end. So I, I was... Going through this message, and I, like I said, I, I really began to see that this message is more about him hungering for us than us hungering for him. But you're going to see both of it in there because there's, the, there's a going back and forth in this relationship that's, that's there with God that we have to hunger for him. And, but he hungers for us first. We only hunger for him because he hungers for us. Realize everyone, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to say a couple of things here that if you've been a Christian for even a couple of years, I told our worship team this this morning, but some of the things that we say sometimes in church, we've heard them so many times, they just kind of like, yeah, okay, yeah, right. Yeah, he died on the cross for us. That, that was so good. Isn't that great? He died. Rose from the dead. That's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm so glad for that. And we don't really realize what he experienced during those times. We don't really realize why he did that. He rescued us. He loves us. Let me read a scripture here out of Philippians 2, 6 and 8. Now, this is the Amplified Bible. And this is Paul speaking about Jesus. Verse 6, he says, Who, speaking about Jesus, although he existed in the form and unchanging essence of God, as one with him, possessing the fullness of all the divine attributes, the entire nature of deity, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or asserted, as if he did not already possess it. I'm going to go back and explain some of this. Or was afraid of losing it. He did not have a need to demand us to know. Oh, that, that was my point. I'm sorry. <laughs> I put a little note in there. I'll get back to that. <laughs> That's funny. Read my own notes. Verse 7. 
but emptied himself without renouncing or diminishing his deity, but only temporarily giving up the outward expression of divine equality and his rightful dignity by assuming the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. He became completely human, but was without sin being fully God and fully man. After he was found in terms of his outward appearance as a man for a divinely appointed time, he humbled himself still further by becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even death on the cross. So let me go back and explain some of this. I love the words that the Amplified used, but, it's a, but it is a lot of words. But what he's saying is that God had so much love for you and I that he would literally humble himself to the place that he didn't need us to even understand that he was God. At that moment, if you read through, the, read through the Gospels, they didn't understand who he was. And guess what he didn't do? Hey, everybody, I'm God. I'm here now. And I need you to worship me. I need you to, to hear what I'm saying. I need you to do it exactly what I'm saying here. He didn't need that positional type of leadership. He was so secure in who he was as God. He said, I'm just coming down. I'm just going to come down and I'm going to do this thing for them. And they're not even going to understand what I'm doing at that moment. One day they will. But in this moment, I'm just going to come down. I'm just going to be with them. I'm going to be a part of who they are. I'm going to become like them. I'm going to literally lay my deity aside, my godship aside. We know that he was all God and all man, but he laid that aside so that nobody could see it. Other than the miracles and things, which still confused everybody. And he said, I'm going to be like them. Because I need to go there. I need to be the lamb. I need to be the sacrifice. I've got to, I've got to die in order so that they can live. I'm willing to do that. I need to do that. I've got to do this. It wasn't just a, hey, this is a good idea. Why don't I send my son down? It was a passion of his heart that said, I've got to save them. I've got to need them. And here, here's something else, though, too, that I, that I really began to realize is that Okay, the Bible says that God is love, right? Shortest verse in the Bible, three words, God is love. That sounds really simple and easy and wonderful too. But if God is love, love has to be expressed. It has to be expressed. If it can't be expressed, it's not really love anyway. So God created the angels. You realize that angels are created. God's always been here. Angels were created at some point, at some time. Lucifer, Satan, every one of them were created at some point. His love had to be expressed. He created you and I out of a need for his love to be expressed. And I'll, I'll go this far to, to begin to question even within myself, because I've said for years, God doesn't need you. God doesn't need anything. But I think in a sense he does. Because if you have all this love on the inside of you and you're out on a desert island, what happens? Nothing. Nothing. I can't get my love out. I'm frustrated. I'm, he had a need within him to say, I've got to express this love. I've got all. I am love. I mean, literally, he is love. And so without that being expressed, it doesn't even make sense. And so he does actually need us to have a relationship. And he doesn't need us as a group. Guess what? What I'm picking up is he needs you. Not the person next to you. Yes, he does. But for the moment, just think he needs me. He needs me so much that he created me. He hungers for relationships so much with me. And it got so severed and broken apart because of our own problem that he was willing to die for you and I. He said, yeah, I created them and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. And man messed it up. And he said, but I'm still going to find a way to bring it back together because I've got to be in relationship with these people. I have to. I have to. And it's not only have to, it's I want to, I must, I've got to. There's such a hunger on the inside of me to be in relationship with them. And I just think that our response to his love and his passion for us is so weak. Mine too. So weak compared to where it should be if we could just realize what he has really done for us. Each of us, every single one of us here, I don't care if you don't like the way you look, if you feel shame and guilt about certain things in your life, if you're frustrated, if you're angry, if you're whatever, if you're messed up in areas, I get all that. 
and God can put you on a journey to, to becoming more and more like him, but he created you. And he didn't create you for the sin, but he created you because he loves you. And I've, I've told my kids this, and I've, we mean this. I don't care what you do. I don't care what happens. And I truly mean this. You're still my kid. I still love you. I may not be able to support your beliefs. I may not be able to support your choices. I may not be able to support what you're doing, but I love you. And it will never, ever, ever, ever stop. I can't. God says that about us. He says that about us. And I, I, I just, I'm hoping that somehow today that, because I, I can't say it, but the spirit of God can minister to you and just realize that I am loved. I am loved by the creator of the world, by God himself. I'm chosen. I'm picked out. I'm formed. He formed you. It wasn't like, okay, well, there's a seed and go for it. We'll see what this baby looks like. He knew exactly what he knitted you together, the Bible says, in the womb. He knew exactly. Some of these things just make so much sense to me. And some of you guys are very creative with food. You're creative with music. You're creative um, in construction and things like that. I'm creative with, with like graphic design. And I understand what it is to create something out of nothing. You begin to form it. You begin to shape it. And like the potter and the clay, the Bible uses a lot because it's such a perfect illustration that he makes, he makes us vessels. We're on the turning wheel and he's sitting there making us exactly what he wants. Every curve, everything's there. And, and to him, he's perfect in doing it. And he has made you exactly the way he wants you. This body's decaying. It'll fall away. Hallelujah. And we're going to get a new body one day. We're going to get a new body one day. And so, yes, you feel weak and all of those things, but that's because of the sin that has entered the world. But I'm telling you, he formed you just the way he wanted you. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 13 tells us, you will seek me and find me when you search me, search for me with all your heart. I love that. You will seek me and find me. Yeah. It's not in vain. We don't just seek him and then he's not there. It's not hide and hide. It's hide and seek. And we seek and we find him and we're going to find him. And then James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. What a promise. What a pro that's a promise. That's not just, oh, that's a nice thing. That's a promise from the Bible. If I draw close to God, he will draw close to me. That's an to me, that's an incredible promise to think that. If we understood really who we are. It's hard to believe for, for me and anybody probably in here to believe that God would want to draw close to me. But he does. He wants to. And he will. And all we have to do is take that first step back to him. Whatever way that looks like to you, I mean, you, you've got to do something. You, you've, got to, you've got to begin to pray. You've got to begin to seek him. You've got to come on, on, on Wednesday nights. You, you do whatever you have to in your car. Um, one, one thing that, that, one thing that I, I think I'm getting way ahead of my notes now, but one thing I want to say right here is this, is that when we pray and we seek after God, that is something we are supposed to have intimacy with. So here's what I mean by that. I'm trying to find my words here, but... If you have worship music on in your house or in your car, maybe at work, that's really awesome. But chances are you're not really worshiping God. It's just on. It's on in the background. You may not even be hearing what the words are doing. Real worship to God comes from stepping aside from everything else. And the Bible even says, go into your closet you know, do this thing secretly and he'll reward you in the open. But we go into that place and we take moments. We take five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, two hours, whatever, you know, wherever you're at. Some people are further along in different things and some people have time to be able to worship him longer than other people. But there has to become a place for every single person in here, not just the pastors or the people who just seem so inspired by God here at this church. Everybody needs to take time. In, in a moment, God, I'm just getting alone with you. I've been going so busy. I've been going so hard. And God, I just worship you right now. 
And you may pray in tongues, you may sing, you may sing in tongues, you may open up your Bible, you may, you may look at that. Don't just read. You know, reading, you can do the exact same thing. Have you ever, ever read your Bible or even a book and you don't even know what you just read? Literally? It's like driving down the road and you don't realize, holy cow, I just drove two miles and didn't even realize it. That's weird. But that's, that's what can happen if you don't truly focus on God and say, God, I'm worshiping you today. I'm setting some time aside. I'm, I'm going after you. And here's what will happen. And I've, I've probably said this before, but here's what will happen. It's been happening to me a lot lately is I'll get this sense in my busyness of him saying, hey, could you come over here? Can I talk with you for a moment? Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, come, come over here. Now, let's, let's worship together. Let's, let's just kind of hang out together. But if I'm not tuned in, I just move on and I move past it. And, and what happens, though, is the more and more that I do that, I get, get in tune with him or I, I push myself out there to worship, the more I'll start to hear him drawing me. In the beginning, it's going to feel, you're going to hear the word, like I'm preaching today, the word is going to begin to draw you to him. Like, man, like in your heart, you might be saying, man, I, I do need to do that. I, I got to do that more. So there's an awakening that's happening on the inside of you. You're, you're hearing it. But now it comes up to you to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go hang out with God. I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to go in the other room. I'm going to go in the bathroom. Tina's talked about that where sometimes she, because we had four boys growing up, they were all only two years apart. Actually, we had twins in the, in, at the end there. So these guys are all like, like think of it, five, three, and two one-year-olds. So it's like, it's just, you know, craziness going on. And, um, is it three? Anyway, something like that. It was crazy. It was, there's a lot of, and, and they're all boys. There's a lot of testosterone in the house and all that. And there are times, especially when they're little, that she just had the, the only place for her to go is go in the bathroom. I just need a break. I got I to gotta go. I got to be with God. I've got to get away. And, I've, and our busyness is like that. You've got to take times where you literally get away. And all I'm saying is that as you do that, you will find that he will be calling back out to you. Your, your spiritual ears will become more and more awake. And your desire for him becomes awakened on the inside. And when you hear those things, when you hear those things, you, you, you I, I'm just telling you, I, I, just, I just start to feel drawn. To it, like if I'll, I'll hear worship music somewhere off in the distance, and I start to feel drawn to it. Like what what's going on over here? And and that begins to happen. Or sometimes he'll he'll just say, "You just need to come come away with me." I've got to be obedient to that though. But he meets me there. He wouldn't be drawing us to him for no reason. So he meets you there, and I'm telling you, that is where true intimacy with God begins to happen. That is where something, something very, very powerful begins to happen in your life. Life changing. I'm not kidding you. Life changing. The very things that you have struggled with begin to drop off. The very hurts that we have on the inside of us begin to come off and fade away. There was, there was I don't know if I said this last week. I might have. Maybe I said it on Wednesday night. But there was one person when we prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, I guess. And one person actually said, I felt things leaving me. It wasn't demonic. These are just maybe hurts, maybe wounds. You know, I, I don't know. I, it, that's between him and God. But I can almost guarantee it's just it's things that just need to come out. And, and Tina and I have been, we've been talking a little bit, especially her, has been talking about the, the fire of God. And the, the fire of God is, is wonderful and it's awesome, but it's for more than just dancing around and singing hallelujah. The fire of God will come and it will pull out those impurities. It'll pull out that junk. And guess what? It pulls out the hurts. And I don't know, I don't have a clue why our flesh loves to hang on to hurts and wounds, but it does. It, it, it just, oh no, no, it, it feels insecure if it doesn't, I don't, I don't get it because when you start to break away from those things, woo, there's, I mean, absolute freedom, joy, peace that comes into your mind, comes into your heart. And it's just like, ah, oh, I can think, literally, I can think straight. I can, I, I can put things together. All these things begin to change in our lives. And it's a just, it's just a powerful thing. But if you're unwilling you yourself because your spouse can't do it for you and your, your pastor can't do it for you and your kids can't do it for you. Kids, your parents can't do it for you. You've got to seek after God all on your own. 
all on your own. It does not have to be for two hours. Just start with five minutes if that's where you're at. Start with five minutes every day if you can, if that's where you're at. It's not a big problem. Trust me, God will take five minutes. But you'll see that it'll grow. You'll see that there'll be a longing in your life. But just like we're doing today, kind of interrupting the Holy Spirit series that we were on, you will see that, that your flesh tends to want to just kind of fall away from, from doing that. And you've got to discipline yourself. You've got to say, nope, I'm, I'm getting back into that. It's a conscious decision. We talk about that all the time. I'm getting back into the presence of God. I'm getting back into seeking him. I'm going to get back into the word of God. I'm going to get back into to truly stopping and putting on worship music and just worshiping him. That is an that is a on-purpose type of thing that we have to do. And we go after those things and there is such, I, well, I've already said, there's, it's life-changing. It's life-changing when we get over into that place. So the things of this world, none of them last. None of them last. The thrill of victory, so to speak. You know, that, it doesn't last. Money doesn't last. Even your relationship with people may or may not last. Let's put it that way. And it probably will go through some bumps and some curves and some things that you didn't expect. But when we find and get into the presence of God, that relationship there, that is an eternal relationship that you will always have. It will never leave you. He will never leave you. And so that's where we invest our time. That's where we invest our concerns. We do invest our time in people, and we'll talk about that in a moment too, but we really have to go after the things of God and not the things of the world. Matthew 6, 19 and 21. Matthew 6, 19 and 21. It says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That verse, if you will allow it, will expose things in your life. For where your treasure is. Where's your treasure? Remember what we said in the beginning? What are you hungry for most? What do you really want? Treasures come in all different sizes, all different packages. Some, some people love different treasures. Some people need different treasures in their life. Um, all the way from just, I, I need somebody to, to always pat me on the back to I need things, I need material things, I, 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 need, I need sex, I need money, I need gambling, I need all these different addictions that can be out there, all these different things that, that the world presents to us as if it's something that, that is good for us and we all really truly know that it's not and all of these things are fleeting, none of them are worth going after, the only thing going worth going after is God himself. Is God himself. And so if that becomes your treasure, that's where your heart's going to be. And so allow the spirit today to ask you, where is your hunger? Where is your treasure at? What do you really want? And if it's not God himself, then change that. Because here's the, here's the really cool thing. You can, we're supposed to go after jobs. We're supposed to go after raising our children. We're supposed to, I, I even believe, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that everybody is supposed to be wealthy, but I believe that you're, you're supposed to have a job so that you can have a decent living, so that you can give at church, you can give to other people and, and you know, live, live a decent life while you're here. I believe all that's fine, all that's biblical. But if those things become a greater importance to me than the presence of God, then I've got things out of line. And, that, and that's all I'm trying to say today here is that, that Keep those things in line. You could still have a nice house. You could still have a nice car. But if it has your attention more than God himself, then something's out of a line. Something's messed up. If a relationship has more of your attention than your attention for God, something's out of alignment. Something's not right. That relationship may, be, may even be good. But don't get it out of alignment with God. Teenagers, and of course, lust can easily do that. You, you get relationships out of focus real easy. I, I can remember in my own, own mind thinking, you know, I'll, just, I'll use Tina like, oh, she's everything. 
She's, she's, oh, she's great. Just, I got to see her. I got to talk to her. I, we would be at each other's house. And by the time one of us would get back home, we got to call each other. You know, it's that, it that type of thing. But God cautions us to, to not get out of balance with these things. Obviously, our relationship was a good thing. But if it becomes out of balance, then I'm making her my God instead of God. And so we keep everything in balance. And then I think you can have, it can, it can be healthy that way. So Matthew 6, kind of sums all this up. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He's saying, don't worry about all that stuff. I'll give you what you need. I'll even give you some of your wants, but you've got to really seek after me and just trust me with this stuff. Trust me that you'll have enough money. Trust me. I mean, when he, as I started to kind of in my own mind, look at some of this, when he says that he'll take care of the birds and the flowers and the grass, like every single day we, we feed our birds. So we, we'll, we could have like 20, 30 birds out there at one time because we take Steve Miles' birds anyway. We usually put enough seed out. They all come over to our house. He's accused us of that. And so we get a bunch of birds over there and um, they see the food and they come and get it. But I don't think if they're sitting up in the tree, they're sitting up there going, I don't know what I'm going to eat next. I don't know where the food's going to come from. How's this going to happen? Who's going to feed me? I just don't understand what's going to happen here. And their feathers start falling out. They're freaking out. <laughs> that doesn't happen with them. They literally, as the Bible would say, don't worry about tomorrow because today's got enough problems of its own. They really just go by the moment. Oh, there's food. Okay, I guess I'll eat here. Oh. There's something else. And truly, I really do believe, again, we, we have jobs and things like that, but I truly do believe that God says, look, if you will trust me with this, I'll give you everything you need. It's all going to be met. It's okay. I don't have enough for, for my retirement, God. It's not going to happen. I don't, I don't know how it's going to happen. I, I guess we're going to starve. I guess, I mean, he says, no, just, just hold on. You're, you're not even there yet. Don't worry about that. I've got you covered. I know what you'll need. I've already got a way for it to happen. It might be a little different than what you thought, but don't worry about it. I got it. You don't even need to think about it. It's already taken care of. That's what can really happen. That's like, that's like real peace when we can get to a place like that. And God loves us so much that this is what he's offering to us. He's offering a, a real relationship with him so that we can walk in peace and we can walk in confidence and we can walk in courage and realize too... I. I this world is short. It's, it's short. I don't care how old you are, it's short. When you look at the world, your lifespan compared to eternity, is, you're not even going to see it. It's not even a pinprick on there. It's so tiny, it's ridiculous. Eternity just goes on and on and on and on. But we're worried about the pinprick. The little tiny, tiny spot in eternity. We don't need to. And I'm just telling you that when we get into the presence of God, when we seek after him with all of our heart, we begin to have an eternal view instead of a pinprick view. This little dot that I'm concerned about. And I begin to see eternity. And I begin to say, you know what? This, this world, it, it, it doesn't matter as much as I think it does. It's going to be okay. God's got my kids. God's got my finances. God understands all this stuff. He knows what I need. I'm going to trust him. I'll work hard. I'll do what I'm supposed to do in the natural. But I'm putting him first in my life. And, and that's what he is looking for us to live like. I'll go ahead and ask the worship team to come back up here. Mark 12, Mark 12, verse 30 to 31. It says, you are to love the Lord Yahweh. This is out of the Passion Translation. You're to love the Lord Yahweh, your God, with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, with every thought that is within you, and with all your strength. That is the great and supreme commandment. And the second is this. You must love your neighbor in the same way you love yourself. You will never find a greater commandment than these. It's a command from God, and actually it sums up our entire life. That if we love God, if we truly love God, we wouldn't even sin, to be quite honest. How could I, how could I hurt somebody who I truly love? And I know that you, you do, but I'm just saying if you had that perfect, mature love, the word perfect 
when the Bible talks about it, he, he, the word perfect is in Matthew 5. And he talks about having this perfect love. And that word perfect, all that it really means is that you're complete and you're mature. You've grown up in this love. It's complete and it's full. And God says, God actually says in Matthew 5, he actually says that, that, he, would, uh, that he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Do you realize that the sunrise is a gift from God? But it's not only a gift for everyone who believes in him. It's for those who can't stand him, who don't know him, who reject him on purpose, who rebel against him. When it rains and we need rain, it falls on all of us. He reaches out to us all. He loves us all. It's such, a, it's such an amazing thing to think that he loves you so much before you love him. He loved us first and it causes us to love him, but he loved you first when you and I were really, really unlovely. I think we're still unlovely, but at least I, I want him. I, I'm trying to understand him. I, I believe that he died on the cross for me. You know, I've got these things there. I'm a Christian, I'm born again, but I'm still not very lovely, but he loves the one that would murder somebody else. I don't get it, but he loves the terrorist. He loves the one that will steal and take things from you and try to hurt your own children. He loves them. It doesn't mean that he condones what, what, what they're doing. He doesn't mean that he's okay with it. It doesn't mean that they're not going to be punished even for it. But he loves them as a human, as a child. He loves them. He created them. That's not what he created them for, but he loves them. And he's hoping that they'll come back to him. And if they choose not to or come to him in the first time, if they, if they choose not to, he made himself available. And that's why you and I become guilty, guilty of our own sin, because he has made himself completely available to us. And yet many people still reject him. They still reject him. First John 4.10, last scripture, 1 John 4.10. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. I wanna on purpose do this a little bit different today. Would you guys just close your eyes? You can bow your head if you want to, but whatever, just close your eyes and just kind of listen to the words that I'm saying and As God created the world, he obviously made you and I. He made you and I to express love. He created Adam and Eve. He created everyone that's, that's ever been born. He actually set that into process. And he knows you before we're even born. He knows you in your mother's womb, it says. And he loves you so, so much. And yet what has happened is that from the beginning of time, we have rejected God and we've turned away from God. And what it has done is it has separated us from God. We've become separated from him. And that's why he said, I'm going to send my son Jesus. And God became man and walked on this earth and he willingly gave up his life to be a sacrifice. Because in order for a will to work, that person has to die. So for the new covenant to be born, to begin to be in function, to work, Jesus, God himself, had to die. And he died for you and I so that his will would basically be broken open and put into active, active uh uh, activity and used in our lives that will offers us salvation he said because of my death here's what i'm giving them i'm giving them life i'm giving them salvation 
if they will trust in me, if they will know me, when they die, they will spend eternity with me. It's an amazing exchange that Christ himself became sin on the cross so that I could become righteous, right standing before him. He paid your price, my price for my sin. He paid it. He paid it. Nothing you can do about that. He paid it. It's done. All you have to do is believe it. Believe that he died on the cross, that his blood was poured out, that his blood alone is the payment. His blood alone washes your sins away. Believe that he rose from the dead. The Bible says on the third day after they put him in a tomb, on the third day, he rose from the dead. When he rose from the dead, all of sin, all of death was defeated once and for all, forever. Death no longer had victory. There was no longer a sting to death because it couldn't take anybody that didn't want it, so to speak, that didn't want to reject God. Every person who says, I need Jesus in my life can and will be saved if they call out to him. Every person, every single person. And today in this place and, and online, if you're watching us, I'm just asking you, have you ever given your heart to Jesus Christ? Have you ever asked him to be your Lord and Savior? Have you ever said, God, I need forgiveness in my life. I'm, I'm so messed up. I need forgiveness. I need this sin washed away. Maybe you said it years ago, months ago, but you just feel like, man, I don't, I don't know where I'm at right now with God. I, I just, too much has happened. I don't think God would accept me anymore. But God says, yes, I'm right here. I'm right here. And so in this moment, I'm going to say a prayer. And I want everyone out there, whether you're online or you're in this room, if you have never given your heart to Jesus Christ, or if you think you have in the past, but you're not really sure, you just don't know, maybe you're just a little confused today. Don't worry about it. All you need to know is that Jesus died on the cross for you. When he died, his blood was poured out so that your sins would be forgiven. He paid the penalty of your sin because you and I deserve eternal death. And he paid that price. You don't have to die eternally. You don't have to go to hell. He made a way so that you can spend eternity with him in heaven. So if that's you out there today, you're, you're saying, you know, that's, that's me. I need, to, I need to make that decision today. I need to say that prayer. I need to accept him as my Lord and Savior. Then just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Father God, I thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross, for allowing your blood to be poured out, and for dying on my behalf. Thank you for paying the price of my sin. And thank you for de de uh, defeating sin and death by rising from the dead. I ask you today, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Change me forever. Fill me with your presence. And today, I make a decision to receive you as my Lord and Savior. I am forgiven. I believe in you. I believe in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. So I know that there were people, there's sometimes you just, you, you, you're going through something like this and you know that somebody somewhere, whether they're in this room or they're online, that they're hearing that prayer, they're hearing that call and they're making that decision in their heart. And so I don't know if it's somebody in this room, but fortunately, if you're in this room, we've got, when you head out of here today, uh, there's a little book that we want you to get. It's a super important book. Inside that book is another little, even tinier book. And that book tells you a little bit more about this decision that you made today. It's so important that if you have even a doubt in your mind as to where you're at, maybe even today you're like, I didn't really fully say that prayer, but I, I want to, I, I think I do. I just need to know more than get the book on your way out. Just 
draw closer to God. Because if you're in that place and you haven't even given your heart to Jesus, he's drawing you. It says he first loved us and you're literally experiencing that love as he draws you to him. So keep chasing after him. Keep chasing after him. Now, here's what I want to do. As much as everybody's able to, I want to ask you guys to just stand up with me if you're able to, if you want to. And we're going to sing this song, Nothing Else, once again. And all I can say is, would you make this a heart cry of yours? To the best of your ability, I want you to try to do some, th some new things. Maybe close your eyes as you're worshiping. Maybe even lift your hands. You have the freedom to lift your hands. You have the freedom to kneel where you're at. You have the freedom to even come up here and, and so to speak, kneel at the altar and just get before God. Whatever, whatever kind of commitment that you need to make, we just need to get into a place where we just say, God, number one, we're appreciative of your love for us because that's, that's incredible. And so God, today we give our love back to you and we hunger for you and ask him, ask him to fill you, ask him to come into your life greater than ever before. If you've asked for, for him to fill you once, you know, in the past, a long time ago, it's okay because that word says to actually be filled or be being filled. So we constantly need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I found it in my own life, the more times that I just say, and it's not, it's, it's times that I'm actually seeking him. I'm not just saying it like it's some kind of mantra. I'm actually seeking him. I said, God, just fill me with your presence. I, I want, I want less of you. And I mean, I would need more of you and less of me. God, fill me. God, change me, God. I desire you, God. And so father, as we get ready to sing this song, we just prepare our hearts right now. God, would you come and fill our hearts, fill this room with your presence, God. We, we need to cry out to you today, God, and maybe some of us just need to ask for forgiveness for not pursuing him the way we should or whatever is in your heart, express it, express it. He wants to see your heart today. Father, come and fill this place. Fill our hearts. And change us, God. Change us into more like you.